maybe we can get there. Uh, I put it into the universe because I believe in speaking, putting things out there that we want. So now it's out there. <laughs> um, also, I changed the background again. I'm like, I don't know. I think I really like this one. You guys let me know what you think, but I'm like really feeling this. Let me know. Okay. I have a case for you today that I had kind of heard about before, kind of not, but today we're going to be discussing the Connecticut River Valley Killer. So throughout the 1980s, late 1970s um, is when they think that it started. Throughout the 1980s, multiple women were found murdered along the Connecticut River, which runs through New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and of course, Connecticut. The killer has never been identified, and he has been linked to at least six murders and one attack with an intent to murder. But his total number of murders is thought to be much higher. This case is so incredibly frustrating because this killer was so good at what he did that he didn't leave like any evidence behind. He was a criminal mastermind at concealing evidence, hiding his identity, that he got along with it for years, and he tortured women along Route 9, the I-91, for years. But we do know about his victims, at least those murder victims that we for sure know are linked or have thought to been linked. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's do that. Kathy Milligan was born on May 25th, 1951. She graduated college in 1972 and she got a job at a publishing company called Addison Publishing. She was married to the love of her life, whose name was Charles, and she enjoyed photography and art, and, I mean, she worked for a publishing company, so she enjoyed all of that stuff. She was young and beautiful, and at only 27 years old was, you know, had her whole life ahead of her. On October 24th, 1978, she left her job at Addison Publishing and decided she was going to go to the local nature preserve and work on a photo shoot that she was doing for the New Hampshire chapter of the Audubon Society. So she goes out there and she's taking pictures and her husband knows that's where she is. Her workmates knew that's where she was. But she never came home. And after she didn't show up for work on the following day, October 29th, she was reported missing. That very same day, her body was found in the exact same spot that Kathy had been taking pictures. Kathy had been stabbed 29 times and just left for dead. She was the first victim and unfortunately there would be many more. Mary Elizabeth Critchley, or Betsy as she was known by her family and friends, was born on December 25th, 
Betsy was doing that day. So, she goes to her appointment. Um, the last thing that we know was that she, after her appointment, was dropped off um, at Exis, Exit 13 on the Massachusetts Turnpike, and she was going to hitchhike the rest of the way home from there. Her apartment was in Waterbury, Vermont. However, she never came home that night, and her roommate reported her missing the following day. Her body was not found until August 9th on Unity Stage Road in New Hampshire in a wooded area. Her body was very decomposed by that time, having been with the elements or exposed to the elements for three weeks. Um, and all the medical examiner could really say was that foul play was suspected. She was fully clothed when she was found. However, her backpack and the sandals that she had been wearing that day were gone. Bernice Quartamanch, which I'm hoping that I'm saying that correctly, was born on December 24th, 1966. She was one of three children. In 1984, Bernice was just 17 years old, working at, as a nurse's aide at the Sullivan County Nursing Home in the Beauregard Village. On May 30th, she was seen by her boyfriend's mother, again, hitchhiking after work, and she was to head to her boyfriend's to visit him. She never made it to her boyfriend's house, and although everybody was looking for her and law enforcement was looking for her, it took two years to discover Bernice's remains. They were found on April 19, 1986, by a fisherman's on Cat Hall Road in Newport, New Hampshire. So this is the second victim that was found within the vicinity of Newport, New Hampshire. Her autopsy showed that she had knife wounds to her neck and that she had also had a pretty serious head injury. So that's victim number three. And unfortunately, we're not done. At the time of her disappearance, Ellen Freed was 27 years old and she was a nursing supervisor at Valley Regional Hospital. There is very little information on Ellen available online, like for her life before the murder. I couldn't even find her birthday, which makes me just so sad that her case is so, like, there's such a lack of information. However, we know that the last time Ellen was seen was on July 22nd, 1984. She made a pit stop on the way home from work in Claremont, and she called her sister on a payphone. They talked for over an hour on a payphone, which just like to me now is crazy, but they spoke for an hour, and then Ellen told her sister that was a strange car that kept driving by, um, like up and down the road very slowly. Her and her sister talked for a few more minutes after this, um, and then her sister thought that everything was fine, but she did not show up for work the next day, and everyone instantly began to worry because it was very unlike her to not show up for work. Her car was found that same day abandoned on Jarvis Road, which was very close to the payphone that she had been using. However, it wasn't until September of 1985, so over a year later, that her remains were found on the bank of Sugar Creek River in Kellyville. 
Lawyers in Barbara's case have never been able to figure out why Barbara went to that rest stop. There was a snowstorm that night, but she wasn't that far from her house, only about 10 miles, and so it's never made sense that she pulled over unless someone flashed her down. So after Barbara's attack, um, it like really slowed down. There was, it seemed like maybe the killer was done. Her murder, remember, was in January of 1987 and it was quiet for a year and eight months, almost two years until August of 1988. And this would be the final attack. So on August the 6th, 1988, 27-year-old Jane Borowski, who was seven months pregnant, was coming home from a fair in Keene, New Hampshire. She decided to stop at a convenience store and the store was closed, but they had a vending machine, so she decided to get out and grab a soda, which she did. Um, she went back to her car and looked over and noticed a Jeep Wagoneer um, parked near her car. Pretty much as soon as she got in her car, she saw a man walk behind her car and come up to her driver's side window, which was down. She had had the window down. He pretty much immediately reached in and grabbed her, like pulled her out through the window and proceeded to stab her 27 times, and then he just left her for dead. Jane was not dead, thank the Lord, and she managed. Jane is a rock star. She managed to crawl back into her car and drive herself to a friend's house nearby, and when she was at her friend's house getting um, the care the friend had called 911, she noticed that Jeep Wagoneer drive by and do a U-turn and then speed off. Jane was taken to the hospital where it was found that she had two collapsed lungs a kidney laceration, a severed jugular, which, like, you survive that, you, like, the chances of survival on that are, like, so low. Among others, major injuries. Thankfully, her baby did survive, um, but would later be diagnosed, diagnosed with cerebral palsy as a result of injuries um, on the mother. She was able to provide police with enough to make a composite sketch. However, no one's ever been caught. And then they stopped. And I think it's because he realized that she had seen him. She knew his car. And she was going to make it or had a possibility of making it with having gotten to some help and maybe he decided that was enough or maybe and this is what police believe is that he just went somewhere else and did it now there have not been many suspects in this case. Some people link Delbert Talman to the murders because Delbert murdered a 17-year-old jogger um, and where he had left 
actually admitted um, on his deathbed to murdering Agnew, who was the last murder that was the 38-year-old nurse um, who was on the ski trip. So he says that three of his friends and him kidnapped and murdered Agnew, like, for fun. And on his deathbed, he had to get it off his chest. He gave the names of the three friends that he alleged participated in this murder with him. Um, and it is believed that the police have those names. However, like nothing, Gary died and nobody has ever really looked into him any further as to whether or not he was the Connecticut River Valley killer. And that is it. That is all of the suspects that have ever been named in any of these cases. And police are, you know, 100% positive that they were the works of some mastermind serial killer who for what like 30 some years 40 years in some cases has gotten away with murder like I said it in the beginning I'll say it again this case is so frustrating because of how this man has managed to elude police, like, to have killed that many people and not be found out is insane. So what do you think? I would love to hear your thoughts. 